Hi everyone, I'm uh, Nathan from Robotics Australia and I'm here today talking to Mike. Um, Mike's a, a DMD of Incutel, a large um, venture capitalist firm in Australia. Uh, Mike, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself and what Incutel is interested in? So Incutel, um, we, we just started an office in Sydney in, in May 2019, but the, the organization itself goes back about 20 years and we're um, a little bit different. We're a strategic investor, so we invest on behalf of um, the Australian, UK and, and US governments here in, in Australia. And the idea is to help them gain insight, but also access and visibility and potentially the opportunity to engage with startups and their technologies here in Australia, um, but as well as, as letting each of those three governments engage with the companies that are, are being formed in, in uh, each of their, their countries and to kind of short circuit um, that, that potential. So, um, you know, we look at things, I guess at, at a high level, there's, there's probably more things we, we, aren't, we aren't interested in. Um, and that's probably easier to describe, but, um, you know, things like consumer applications, edge you know uh, ad tech edu education technology those things are probably more on the periphery um, but where our sweet spot is if you think about it from um, kind of an intelligence perspective uh, at one end you have all the sensors and things that are out in the field and they gather information um, and so those could be optics you know comms satellites things that enable the the information gathering then there's all the technology that would be used to, to pipe that or, or deliver that uh, information um, back to the enterprise. And every, you know, you can think of each uh, national security agency or, or agency that has some kind of national security mission as an enterprise. And so it has all the underlying things a normal enterprise would need from um, the data center, network compute, the whole stack up to the application to actually derive insight from the information that's pulled from the sensors. Um, so that ultimately those analysts can can be given, you know, in some ways superpowers because, you know, there's not a lot of analysts um, and there's a lot of information that needs to be analyzed. Um, take those insights and then those can be further used to, to inform policy by various um, governments. So, you know, if I break that down, you know, robotics certainly falls in there as a, as a mechanism to um, enhance or even, even gather intelligence um, and we're looking at a lot of different things on the hardware side we have in the us we have a whole practice called the field technologies um, practice that looks um, almost specifically at hardware um, and those are all you know all the things that you can tangibly handle um, and then we have an enterprise practice that's more on the on the software side of things um, but as you can imagine there's a lot of things that i think that span kind of both of those usually with the hardware there's some kind of software component yeah cool really cool so I, th I think it's in interesting because there's this blurry line between what, what the hardware does and what the intelligence does and then what the sensing and perception does and then yep. what the machine comes back. But it, it sounds like a bit there you've painted out a couple of spaces. Um, it, it, you know, some analytic stuff, some cognition, some intelligence would be very useful, but uh, you know, machine intelligence, but then also some maybe hardware to even get the information, get the data in the first place. Um, you didn't really touch on interventions through hardware, so machines that can actually do something. Is that something you know, you're interested in as well? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly an area we'd be interested in. I mean, ultimately, there has to be some way to demonstrate business value or mission value, right? So if, if it is, um, you know, hardware that's actually doing stuff and, and you know, there are use cases, for example, um, you know, DOD or, or um, other government agencies have large warehouses, right? So, you know, using hardware that would help automate um, warehouse operations, things like that. Those are certainly areas where we're looking in. Um, you know, they're largely nascent from a, you know, I think um, broader perspective, but they're things that we keep an eye on. Um, and ultimately, because we're a strategic investor and this is where we, we differ um, from a lot of the, the VCs you're probably talking to, we don't really have a mandate for financial returns. And so that allows us to take some of these bets that might be seen as, as a little bit more patient. Um, you know, we'll, we'll scan uh, kind of the market, 
think about what are some of the things, the converging technology that might affect that market. And, but we're, we're able to, to really get comfort a little bit with taking some risk on things that might be a little bit further out there beyond maybe even the three to five year horizon that some of the, you know, the typical um, financial VCs look at. And I think that's where some of, some of the hardware that's actually automating and doing things itself um, you know, might, might fall on that in, in terms of the investment horizon. But you know, those are the things we look at. And then we try to map those back to a use case or a problem set that we know somewhere inside of our, our government customers, somebody is facing that and trying to solve it. Um, or at least they're seeing it on the horizon as a problem. And we can you know, make an early bet in a company, at least to formulate that um, relationship and get those those end users familiar with the company, you know, we establish feedback loops and all sorts of interesting ways to communicate. And, and that's where we bring a lot of value versus, you know, just a point, just a checkbook that's looking to grow the return. But I, I think you've touched on the two things that really appeal to me personally about Incutel. One is, one is the, the, the patience in the technology. So it's less about an immediate bang for buck return for an on investment, commercial or consumer facing gain. It's more about, um, you know, here, here are these large systems or large organizations in, in your case, governments. They've been going for a while and we, we hope they go for a, a little bit longer. <laughs> uh, if the technology looks like in three, four, five, six years, it's going to make a big impact. That's okay because the country's still going to be there then. Um, so I really, I really like that aspect about it. I also really like probably how the, your, your main customers or your main interests are, are strategic, they are serving the, these it, uh, you know, governments, the militaries, the different agencies, which is uh, very, very different from the consumer market. It's very, very different from just putting something out and going quickly. It's, it's, it's literally huge, right? It's literally like, well, if this works well, that country might adopt it. Yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on to the next question. Sorry, everyone, that wasn't really a question. That was more just... <laughs> On um, the next question, which I feel like is almost a waste of your time, Mike, but I want to ask it anyway. Is there uh, any reason you wouldn't consider Australian technology, Australian robotics and ro uh, robotics related technology? Or are you really here because of it? No, I mean, yeah, we're, we're here because of it. Um, you know, we, we're very interested actually in supporting Australian technology, and that's, that's kind of our main mandate. So, again, my my main sponsor here and, and my main customer is the Office of National Intelligence in, within the Australian government. And we sit under this um, kind of science and technology and innovation pillar that they have. And, and there's a whole bunch of other things that are, that are helping to propel that. Um, but we're one of the main, I think, um, mechanisms to catalyze the government's um, acceptance and, and use of, of innovation. So part of our mission is to just propel and, and help kind of nurture the, the startup ecosystem here in Australia. And we've been told at the, you know, the highest levels of some of these conversations that we've been having that, um, yeah, sure, the, the strategic implications of the technology is, is one part of the mission, but helping to actually grow world-class, um, world-leading Australian businesses is part of that mission as well. And, and you know, that's something that, that we're definitely trying to do. Um, again, it all comes down to what's the value and strategic implication the technology can deliver. If it's an Australian robotics company and it happens to, to meet a, a mission that's not being addressed by you know, either another Australian company or even a robotics company in the US, um, that's something that we can highlight. So by, by becoming part of the Incutel portfolio, we would have the opportunity to highlight that company not only inside the Australian government, but in the US government. And the US government as well is, all, is also part of this program. So they have an appetite to consume technology that's not just developed in the United States, right? Um, you know, and, and, and with Australia being one of our biggest allies, they have a, you know, a, a very, um, are open-minded to um, pointing Australian technology at some of their, their main uh, mission use cases. So if it happens to be an Australian robotics company, it scratches the itch for a mission over there. You know, there's, there's a likelihood that um, there's a potential to engage with that government customer. Um, and as we know, the U.S. government has a, you know, big, big budget. And it's a big IT spender. 
Um, and so there, you know, there's potential to, to grow that relationship and it could be actually pretty fruitful, both from a strategic perspective for the government and, and being able to access innovation that's cutting edge and leading edge and, and didn't, you know, wasn't necessarily developed inside government or systems integrator. And then from the company's perspective, being able to potentially bring on a customer of that size at a very early stage, and, and and we act as kind of the bridge, um, and almost a proxy, you know, federal sales apparatus for a company to to test the waters for their technology inside government. So that's probably a long winded winded way of answering that question, which is, uh, yeah, there's there's as long as the value's there and it's solving a problem, there's no reason why we wouldn't invest in Australian company. But I think that's absolutely. Hey, Gordon, I think you, you did probably a better job than you have before by dragging the US into it because there's definitely a perception in Australia that no one's that interested, no one looks, no one's uh, you know out there scouting for us. But it's interesting what you said, it's a complete opposite to the actual truth. Yeah, no, I mean, I think the normal kind of playbook most people run is, is um, <clears throat> you know, you, you develop a technology here in Australia, you, you test it with the market here. Um, but we know that the market's much, much smaller here in Australia. But as long as you've got those good demonstrations of value, you, you know, maybe you bring on a couple good reference customers. Um, and then you seek to, to either raise capital in the U.S. or start to do a little bit of, of discovery in the U.S. from a customer perspective. If that's successful, you know, that obviously opens up that market and, and it's much bigger. That's actually interesting because there's at least a few Australian companies I can think of or startups I can think of who have the aspiration, you know, to raise money in the US. So is that something you're interested in uh, helping shepherd uh, introductions across opportunities? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, that's certainly part of our value here. There's not many US based firms that have, you know, brick and mortar operations in Australia. We're, we're one of few. Um, and because we've been around in the US for a while and very successful uh, from an investor standpoint, um, a strategic investor standpoint, we've we've co-invested with many of the, if not all, of kind of the tier one financial VCs in the U.S. At least at some point, we have over 500 portfolio companies, right? Yeah. So, and we're kind of we're known more for the technical diligence and really looking under the hood at at the fundamental properties of technology. That enables us to actually take a little bit more risk than some VCs would because. You know, we're we're gaining conviction that a technology works because we've looked at it, not necessarily because we've talked to a number of customers and they've told us, you know, the, the value it solves or they've renewed contracts and that in and of itself shows that it probably works. And as an investor, I can get comfortable with that. That that helps if the company is at that stage. But if not, you know, maybe they're just starting trials. Um, you know, they're very early on kind of the, the customer engagement side of things. Um, we're able to take a little bit more of a of a stance early on technology, and then we we can communicate that conviction to a lot of the tier one um, or you know whatever tier, just financial VCs in the U.S. and help them get comfortable with something um, from their risk, whatever their risk appetite is. And so we've continued that here in Australia. So there's a couple of our current portfolio companies that we've helped um, already go over to the U.S. We've helped them refine their pitch for a US VC audience versus, you know, kind of the Australian VC audience. And there are some, some nuances there um, and I helps them go over. But okay, nuances. What's that? I would have said major differences, but okay, nuances. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. And it's, it's, there's differences on, on how, you know, the, the VCs look at things and there's differences on how the companies need to kind of present themselves. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, but, but we've been successful and, and some of our companies have gone over to the U.S. and, and raised a good deal of, of capital. Um, you know, I think the way to think of, of Incutel is, is kind of, you know, a way to, it's, it's a two-way bridge across the ocean um, back to the U.S., right? So, and we can travel both, both directions, whether that's bringing VC dollars here, bringing technology companies over there, vice versa. So, you know, if there's, if the Australian VC market decided they had appetite and wanted to try to get into some uh, U.S. deals, we could probably do that as well. Um, but again, it's it's kind of a two-way yeah. bridge across the ocean. I'm hearing two really strong themes there. One is <clears throat> endorsed to ventures markets or venture players. Another is endorsed to end users. In your case, the end users are some of the biggest governments in the world. 
and his endorsed the VCs, uh, the VC market again is some of the biggest VCs in the world. So it seems like um, a useful have a uh, useful thing to have. Also, it seems a little bit scary, hence the stutter of the technology better be good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we spend a good amount of time, um, you know, going as you recall um, our own diligence process <laughs> with Prescient. Um, you know we take a good deal of, of, of time to understand um, to the best of our ability. And, and we have technologists on our, on our roster. So Incutel in the US has about 20 engineers or so um, that we bring on and they come from all different parts of industry, government systems integrators, startups themselves, and that are now part of our deal teams. And they you know, have specific uh, expertise in, in whatever the, the tech area is. And they'll help us do the, do the diligence and ask all the right questions and make sure that you know, if the technology looks like, you know, it's, it, it, it's in its current form today, and maybe that's even serving a commercial problem, you know, it's not hard to imagine that the government uh, has either a different environment it needs to plug into or different requirements. So there might be just, you know, some small tweaks or enhancements yeah. that need to be built into that product, and we can help inform that. And then the company benefits by being able to take those enhancements and features that we informed, have built them into the product, and then can point it at the commercial problem as well. So we're not, you know, we're not trying to, to have some forked federal version. Um, you know, the whole idea of Incutel is to make use of, of the, you know, the private market to drive and, and propel technology and then point it at the government um, when it makes sense to do so, but then also establish that feedback loop. So, you know, very discern to your, to your point, there's, they're big customers, they're very discerning customers. You know, they have specific needs and frameworks and um, you know, compliance and different rule sets they need to operate in. Those aren't super unlike some of the more regulated industries, you know, on the commercial side, banking, insurance, you know, healthcare. And so, you know, building a product that works in the framework of the government and often pointing that at some of those heavily regulated industries on the commercial side is a pretty good way to transfer that value. So I think for maybe if anyone ends up listening to it, I think for their sake, it's worth mentioning that the, so there is there is work to be done to support a diligence pr uh, process like you're talking about, but it's an investment definitely worth making. So from the startup side, you, you know you make that investment. Uh, just having seen how far you guys go to amplify that and show other people and bring other people on board and put it in front of here or there, and, and just the effort to get it, uh, you know, technology is ready for particular markets that then makes it reusable more broadly. Um, so, you know, I, I think sitting on one side of it, it just looks like a lot of work and a lot of promises. Sitting on the other side of it, it's worth the investment. Yeah, I mean, and, and oftentimes what happens is, um, you know, it's it's all it's all it's all up here, right? You have it, and and you know, there's a lot of information that maybe you you're not sure how to organize and put it down to help really paint a picture of how you're differentiated, and you start to go through one of these processes with with an investor who's asking, you know, how are you positioned against the competitive landscape? What is the competitive landscape? And if there aren't, you know, kind of apples to apples comparisons, what's what's the best next thing? Because, you know, as you start to talk to more financially driven investors, they're going to want to know what's what how is this horse different from the other ones I could potentially bet on and what are its prospects, right? And, you know, if you can start to get this all on a way that it's presentable and easily consumed, um, you know, I think that only helps to make the process easier going forward. It might be a little bit painful in, in the beginning, um, but it helps for all the other subsequent conversations you'll have. Inside and outside. Okay, Mike, you ready for some rapid fire questions? Yeah, sure. Okay, so what, what is something that you guys, uh, your fund looks for in an investment? Um, well, I think some of the things we, we touched on before, and really it's, it's kind of the alignment between a known kind of, you know, problem set in, in mission use cases and, and the value that a startup potentially can provide and how, how that is differentiated and, and how defensible is it as well. I mean, another thing we do is just, we try to benchmark against all the other known technologies out there and, and really figure out why is this one worth making a bet on um, versus the other one. Sure. And I think you've kind of led into the second question is why would you pick investment A over the top of investment B? Yeah. I mean, and it's, you know, it's not just one 
thing. It is kind of taking a look at um, other things holistically and, and things that other investors probably talk about. I mean, there's one, there's the technology and the problem it's solving. Two is, is the team and really getting to know the team and how um, committed they are to the problem, how passionate they are, how, you know, have they shown kind of ability to, to execute and innovate quickly and um, really dedicate themselves to solving certain problems quickly, how, you know, how pleasant are they to work with, right? Because ultimately from our perspective, you know, we make kind of an early equity only investment here in Australia um, with the idea to hopefully transition that over to a more working engagement with some government customer. We want to know that the people that we're sending to the government customer um, is going to be, you know, a group that, that they'll enjoy working with, but also be very productive in working with and establish a good working relationship in that, in that feedback loop, which is very important. Okay, I probably should have asked those questions before I took your money. <laughs> um, so what would a typical deal flow look like for you guys or, you know, what's the best way they even meet you in the first time, uh, instance? Um, well, I think, you know, our, our contact information is on some of those Australian VC spreadsheets that are floating around. Um, and I can probably point you to that with a link um, after this at some point. Um, you know, going through other, other founders um, that we've engaged with, um, those are always really good, warm intros. Um, and I take those very seriously as well. If one, one founder introduces me to another founder, um, those are conversations that I want to I wanna have. Um, you know, in, in a normal world, we try to get around to a bunch of industry events. Um, you know, if, if Robotics Australia Group is putting on events, that's, that's something that, you know, we would, we would probably attend um, and talk to different startups and people that are, that are doing things, um, whether they're still in kind of academia and have, have prospects of, of commercializing a technology, or even if they've already, you know, kind of formed an early uh, company and, and maybe don't think they're necessarily at a position where they have something to bring to an investor. Um, you know, we like to, to get, get introduced early and start establishing those relationships because it's not always just a, hey, we're ready for money. Let's meet, have a couple conversations, and then you invest. You know, part of meeting the team is getting to know them early, you know, because they may not, they may not be successful in a first endeavor, but you know, you know, from meeting them that they're, they're a good founder we, we want to have that i think that that's a bit, um, rookie mistake that they kind of I, I don't want to talk to an investor and tell them i'm ready to pitch and like they're people they're people just like us go and say hello hang out have a coffee what about this what about that i'm working on this what do you think about that if the first time you see them the ask is how are you yeah <laughs> well a lot better received than the first time you see them invest, uh, the ask is for money yeah, no, absolutely. But it, it doesn't always happen that way. And, and, you know, you, you meet companies for the first time on their fund fundraising um, journey, and that's fine because, you know, we can't meet everybody in the ecosystem. Um, you know, but we, I, you know, we met you guys through a warm introduction and, and a firm that we work with quite often. And they, they on the surface thought that there was a lot of alignment. And so, you know, we, we could put credence in that and then just use that time um, during that diligence process to, to meet you guys and, and build conviction in the technology and, and the team. Yeah, that's interesting. So I'm kind of hearing there is no real set way, but a warm introduction that shortcuts a, a bit of the um, unknowns is welcome. Yeah, or, or just, uh, you know, try to get yourself out there, um, you know, on the, in, on the interweb somewhere uh, in areas that, that are interesting because we do source some things as well and we'll do outreach and if something's interesting and, and, um, and I have a way to find contact information, um, you know, if it, even if it's just, you know, a, a contact us on a web page for a company that I think is doing something interesting. Let me say, what, what the heck, let me just shoot them a note and, and introduce who we are and see if they want to chat. You know, cool. and, and, and we do that quite often. Cool. Okay, so another one, this one, I think is probably the last one. I, are you afraid of hardware? If there's hardware involved in a company, is that necessarily a red flag? No. Um, and, I, you know, kind of going back to the, our, the previous conversation about all the things that we invest in in that whole pipeline. I mean, hardware is a big piece of that. Um, you know, I think most of the companies we invest in, though, that, are doing hardware have some kind of novel software piece of it, right? So it's really the convergence of software and hardware. And, and most of those companies, when I speak to them, 
long term maybe don't necessarily want to be in the hardware business because they understand that you know somebody can come along with a hammer break open the hardware and if they really wanted to figure out what's going on in there um, but really the the brains and the software and how those things interoperate is really where the you know the special sauce is and so we look for things that are defensible from that perspective um, you know we'll also look for things that Sometimes because we have such a large portfolio, maybe the software is, is over here by some company, there's a hardware capability over here, and we may be able to figure out how those two things interoperate or how it plugs into a, a different platform that some of our customers are using so that it can just become one piece of a more holistic um, approach. You know, So like the warehouse automation example might be somewhere where we look for something that can plug into a bigger operating system that's running a whole you know, warehouse automation platform, but we need, you know, the robotic arm to do some specific thing in some specific place. Yes, I think that's really interesting too, because we've caught, we've caught often, I've seen in Australia have, I don't know, three or four elements to a solution and it, you know, a subset, two or three of them are absolute gold and it would be good to build them into another system or bring them into something else. Um, but we have maybe a tendency to Unless we provide a whole solution, no one's going to be interested. So it is actually interesting to hear that's worth painting out. Yeah, and it might just be a forcing function in the beginning, in the early stages of a company that is really a software company, but needs to demonstrate the software by putting out some hardware that maybe is not going to be the long-term solution, but it, it helps them demonstrate the capabilities now. Um, and. and but maybe it does evolve into them discovering there there is a way to differentiate that hardware, um, or or do it in a in a very cost effective way because it relies on commercial off the shelf things you know commodity cameras you know we know that the kind of edge processing compute powers is powers increasing prices decreasing you know, there's a lot of things converging where you know I think it might make more and more sense um, at least at the early stages for a company to to have that hardware piece and, and that's how we think about it. Yeah, cool. Okay, final question before I let you get on with your day job. <laughs> this one's a really simple one. You shouldn't struggle with this at all. What, what can we do to make Australian robotics more investable? Um, I mean, I think a lot of it is just, is just telling that that story and, and um, you know, really helping the the investor ecosystem understand without having to pull too much understand what the value proposition is and, and the differentiation and help uh, to paint the picture that even though there may be a hardware piece that hardware is not a bad word right and and um you know at the end of the day there are physical things that have to interact with the physical world and it's usually the hardware that's going to be doing that right um i think that's that's probably the best answer i can give there I think that was pretty clean. I, I like it. Okay, Mike, I think we can probably wrap up of, uh, on that one. So thank you very, very much for your time. Super appreciate it. Yeah, no worries. Enjoyed it.